Welcome to the Rex Andrews Show. Glad to have you with us. If you are a first-time listener, welcome to the conversation and welcome to the show. A couple things for our first-time listeners, well, any of our listeners, but please don't forget to subscribe. Uh, that way you can get the latest updates. We also recommend that you stop on by the rexandrewshow.com. Uh, when we interview our guests, uh, we try to cover a lot of things, but most of the time we're just uh, hitting the tip of the iceberg. So stop on by, look up your favorite guests on the show information and some cool stuff. Uh, the Rex Andrews Show is a daily good network production. Um, we also have a, one favor to ask from you, from our new listeners. Uh, we're not shy. We're not uh, um, bashful. In fact, I've got a collar on, so I'm going to say I'm a well-dressed beggar today. We'll beg you for some star ratings. The more stars you give us, the better placements we have in the app stores. And then we'd like to welcome back um, our listeners who um, make this show what it is in addition to our listeners. The uh, show is listened to in 32 countries, across six continents, in over 500 cities. So we have people all over the planet, and I would like to welcome in those listening in Perth, um, Australia. So welcome to the show, um, those coming back from Perth. So glad to have you. All right. Um, can't think of any more housekeeping items. Let's get on with the program. You know, the, the Rick Sanders show is all about biographies and people's stories, amazing people doing amazing things. Got another one of those with us today. Um, we really try hard to find people doing unique things or in thought leadership. And I think we have a combination of both of those today. So um, let me introduce our guest here a little bit. Um, he's a peer of mine, he's a father, okay? And the father is probably the greatest role a man can play next to being a husband. Those are probably neck and neck, but a father of four. So uh, a great accomplishment there. Um, he is an independent technology analyst, been in technology for more than 25 years broad, broad portfolio of experiences. And so we'll talk about some of that. Um, he is a connector of interesting people. So I love this. Um, I try hard to be one of those super connectors. And it looks like Scott is also. So I'd like to have, glad that he's on the show and we'll talk about some of that. Um, he's very purpose-driven. He's doing things that are uh, purpose-driven. And because of that, he is the founder of a sustainable development goals type company, okay? So he's doing things to put good back in the world. And I like that because that's one of the reasons I do this show. You, you can't go on the internet or out there in media and see anything but bad. So I like to do good things. So I'd like to welcome to the, the show and the program coming to us this morning from over the pond, and I'll let him give us some details, Scott Stoneham. Scott, how are you? I'm very good, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on and for such a wonderful introduction there. Glad to have you. So, uh, okay, so where are you coming into uh, the show from? Where, you know, we inter pe interview people all over the world. Today I am in Slovakia, Central Europe, and um, it's a toasty 38 degrees centigrade today. So ah, it's nice and warm here. Yeah. It's the summertime, summertime that. Okay, fantastic. Well, Scott, um, there's a lot to unpack here. And since both of us are technologists, uh, we probably talk for hours and hours and hours on all kinds of geek stuff. And so, and for those listening, geek is an affectionate term in our industry. So if you are a geek, even if it's a sales geek, uh, you're still, a, you know, that's still a good thing. Um, but let's go back in time because we want to know what's gotten you to where you are today. Life is like crossing a stream where you hop from one rock to another rock and you eventually get the other side, but sometimes you have to take lateral hops and back hops and those things. So we'll kind of do some of that. So we want to understand influences in your life, and those influences are going to be contributions from all things, but it starts young. So we would like to know, where were you born? Now, you don't have to worry about writing these down, because I'll, I'll bring these questions to you. <laughs> we also want to know, in addition to where you're born, where you were raised. That can also often be different. A lot of people have interesting experiences. I had a guest on the show, um, Ellie Soja, who moved 63 times before she was the age of 15. So uh, that's quite a lot of influence that she was a daughter of an international con man and was on the run. Um, she, uh, next thing we want to talk about is your family life a little bit. Uh, do you have siblings, uh, your parents, uh, what types of influences they are, the types of employment they did while you're growing up? Cause that's big influences. Mm -hmm. um, when I've interviewed the hundreds of people I've done between my radio and 
uh, podcasting career, I've kind of come to the conclusion, and these are, you know, I'm no psychologist. This is just my analysis. There's sort of three buckets that parental influence fall in. The first one is a super supportive. So, wow, you know, parents did everything, loved them, fully engaged, pushed kids along. Okay. The second is kind of the middle bucket where, of course, the parents loved their kids and they were doing the best they could to support them. But because they were so overwhelmed in earning an income and eking out an existence that they just weren't there as much as kids would really desire. And then the last bucket I call the struggle bucket, which is uh, one that's not too great of an environment. It could be environments that include abuse, addiction, extreme poverty, huge dysfunctionality, mental health, stuff like that. So that's a bucket that often for people who are high performers, because that's who I interview, was a motivator to say, I don't want to be anything like that kind of thing. Um, we also then want to know what you did as a kid growing up, what were your interests? Did you play sports, band, theater, computer, shoplifting? And don't laugh, I had a guest on the show, Larry Cole, by the um, age of 15 was a car thief. So he had accomplishments. So um, we want to know what you were up to. Then we'll hopscotch on your education. And then, you know, we don't need to make this a res resume show. But like to talk about some of the things that you've been doing, studying um, technologies, those stuff, but mostly pivot points. Okay. So I worked on X and then I went to Y. And after Y, I, you know, I saw I went, I needed to do Z. And then we want to end up what you're doing today. Cause I'm really interested in the things you're doing in sustainability and, and good. So if you could, Scott, take us back to the beginning. Um, where were you born? So I was born, um, uh, to the north of London, a place called Harrow, um, okay. in the UK. Um, kind of, I think uh, we moved out of there when I was around four, I think, maybe yeah, around that age, a little bit earlier. We moved down into um, down south into a county called Sussex, where Sussex, okay. um, and it was around that time that my brother was born. Um, so he was born. We are actually born on the same day, but separated by four year, four years. Um, so yeah, so born in Harrow, but raised down in Sussex. Okay, all right. So and you just have the the one brother then? <clears throat> yep, yep, yep. Okay, he's enough. He's enough. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, four yeah. four years is a good uh, good spacing because the kids get to be close enough that they can still be relatively close, um, but then also distance enough that they can be their own individuals in school and university things like that. So. Uh, I think it took thought. us a whole childhood to become best friends. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, we stand by each other uh, a lot now. You know, he runs his own business as well. Um, okay. And we work together. So, um, yeah, I mean, the story, I mean, you like the stories. So um, the story with, uh, with that is that um, on my fourth birthday, all I wanted was a bike and I ended mm -hmm. up getting a brother. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I wasn't too too happy to kind of receive my bike and then um, and then be told hop in the car we're off to the hospital it was another day until I could ride my birthday present <laughs> so, uh, I've held that against him for all of his life oh I, I'm sure whenever there's a minute minute of banter that you might uh, still say hey I, I wanted the bike more than you huh so, <laughs> I tell him frequently uh, I'm sure okay so um, tell us a little bit about your parents so my parents um, is interesting because uh, it took me a long while to realize that they fall into that category entrepreneur. Okay. Um, you know, when, when I was growing up, um, it was natural for, for me to see them kind of my dad in particular around the table doing the books, you know, balancing the books. And uh, he was a, he was a draftsman by, by trade. Okay. Um, so he designed kind of um, heating and cooling um, systems for big buildings in the city um, and uh, he was always sitting there with his slide rule doing his calculations on his slide rule um, and I remember one one evening him trying to explain to me how how you use a slide rule and I, I'm sure he explained it very well but uh, <laughs> to this day, I, I, yeah, I have I'm no idea huh calculator, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they were both entrepreneurs um, well they, he started off as that my mum was in, um, in 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 Harley Street um, in the medical industry mm -hmm. um, and then when they they kind of ended up becoming um, distributors for Tupperware oh really yeah um, how cool 
yeah they were they were pretty successful um at that uh, running a big piece of um piece of the uk business i know they got to travel all over all over the world with that as well um, oh i love it my mom did tupperware for the longest time really yeah so and so you you probably have one of those cupboards that my mom calls a chuck it and hope where you're that's all right <laughs> yep, you chuck it and hope, and you but you know it's in there somewhere, and the lid fits perfectly, and it's durable. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, that's that's great. Yeah. So um, yeah, so that's kind of their background. I grew up with them being, um, you know, running this business, um, you know, doing the books, balancing, you know, teams and people and stock and inventory, and uh, just being responsible for their own kind of livelihoods, which was, and then it continued from there, really. Okay, fantastic. So your parents being entrepreneurs, uh, did they have a lot of time to be engaged? Um, with you, I mean, supporting you yeah. as a, your kid, you and your brother? Yeah, it's, um, I, I'm gonna say the answer is yes. Um, but did I let them be engaged as much as maybe they wanted to? Probably not, because I was very much outdoors. Okay. Um, I was, was, as long as the sun was up, I was outdoors somewhere. Um, okay. So, yeah, that's an interesting thing if i start to think about your children of today my kids as well you know that's um i i literally was outdoors from sun up to sundown um, okay so yeah i know they they were always there taking me to all of the sports things that i needed to go to they're always there for me um at school um i know we had lots of fun around the house and the home and things like that but i think I think I was just out. <laughs> okay, lot. you were just out. Now, um, did you play a little sports? Did you play some uh, football, or uh, were you into cricket or tennis or anything like that? Uh, well, that's yeah, um, lots of different things. I was very athletic as a kid. Um, okay, and um, I I used to run for the county. I, I used to be a fast sprinter um, and um, you know a good kind of triple jumper. So I used okay. to do that. Yeah. And then as I came into, as I went through various levels of school, um, I ended up going to a, a private school for a while and um, they, uh, they didn't really, they didn't really do sports that much. Okay. Um, so I didn't really get to do much. And then there was that school kind of closed down um, and uh, a private school that ran out of money. Um, <laughs> you can't um, figure that one out. But um, that closed down and I ended, ended up going back to a state school. And, okay. Um, I got um because i was i was i was pretty much this size when i was 11 and i'm sitting down now um, okay i'm not a tall man but for an 11 year old i'm tall and i'm big right so they put me into the rugby team um and i'd never watched a game of rugby um the only kind of sport like that that i had seen with that kind of ball was american football sure <clears throat> um so they gave they gave the biggest guy in the team the ball and I ran to the other end of the pitch and uh, I ran across the try line and I just threw the ball down like I've seen on TV. Yeah. And uh, you don't get a try by doing that in rugby. <laughs> <laughs> and I, was, That's awesome. I was reprimanded and they were like, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? So yeah, I did that. I did a lot of rugby. I played for the county um, when I when I was uh, kind of six been um i did a lot of martial arts as well and skateboarding was my passion so skateboarding okay lots of stuff going on there and so you were a skate rat riding the rails huh yeah mostly street skating so i was okay. one of those annoying ones who'd be rattling rattling around the pavements and scaring old ladies um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, a lot of fun i wrote i wrote a skate I, I don't know i was just too add in my opinion i did all kinds of things and i rode a skateboard for a while and I was a goofy foot and we did a lot of jumps and stuff. And I don't know, I just kind of, I wore out of it after a certain bit of time, I guess I took in football and those things, American mm -hmm. football and just didn't have time for it. Plus I was always worried about breaking an arm or something. So <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. now I'm gonna ask you a question here. Um, is there, looking back on your, your childhood, your teenage years, uh, setting your family aside, okay? Parents and, and your siblings. Is there someone that you look back and go, wow, this person was a big influence on my life? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, when you say setting aside my family, I mean, I guess yeah. I mean family. Um, my uncle was a very big influence on me, um, as well as my um, grandfather. Um, yeah. So my uncle was uh, an electrician. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I 
you know, he would always give me challenges of, you know, can I solder this to that? Um, he was a p person who got me into computers, first of all, as well, um, gave me a challenge on a computer. Um, but I had, he would, he would come with his toolbox. Every time he came to see us, he'd bring a toolbox and there'd be bits in it that I would take and fiddle with. And I remember I had my bedroom on the wall, there was a metal panel with um, 32 of these, you know, um, toggle switches on. Mm -hmm. And I wired each one of those things to a plug socket or to, I had this um, electronic um, car aerial that would go out the window. Uh, mm -hmm. I had an old oscilloscope that would come on and show the waveform of the music. And I had all of these things hooked up to the to these uh, switches. And nowadays you'd call it a death trap because there was no <laughs> grounding. <laughs> the currents were completely overrated <clears throat> for the switches. And But yeah, I, he, he was a big in, um, inspiration uh for me there really got me into kind of the technology um, okay. and what you can do with it and being able to control things and i think if i look back you know i i graduated in cybernetics and control engineering and if i look back that was probably the first time i was really experimenting with controlling things remotely with these switches um so yeah big influence um my granddad was a very he was um he was in the construction industry um uh, foreman on major some major projects around london and uh, he gave me a lot of real practical hands-on kind of experience. So, you know, I can make this, I can make that. And that's really from his coaching and guidance. Okay, fantastic. Um, so tell us a little bit about your education. Were you a good student? Uh, and then once you finished what we would call high school in the States, uh, did you go off to university? You know, give us a little picture of that uh, aspect of your life. Yeah, I was a good student. Um, I think, yeah, I was. I was a high achiever. Um, and uh, I remember, it's funny how you look back and you find those, you're talking about these pivotal moment, moments. I remember when I was at um, primary school, junior school, um, I used to stay in over break time to do extra work um, because I enjoyed doing, you know, maths, math. Um, and there was this one time where I was getting bullied for that um, because, you know, I was the nerd. You know, and I, I heard you use the term geek, but nerd at the time was not as complimentary. Yes, true, true. <laughs> and I'm um, not sure ner nerds even still today has is as complimentary as geek. It's a funny fine line, isn't it? Yeah, very fine. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was I was uh, I got bullied and I actually got pushed down some stairs and broke my finger um, because I was I was studying uh, instead of outside chasing kids around the playground. Um, so then, yeah, that, that, I did well. I, I came out of high school with some good grades, um, and, uh, I didn't quite have the grades to get into the, uh, degree, uh, the university that I wanted, but I, there was a bit of, um, there was a bit of luck involved, um, uh, for the interview and the question that they asked me in the interview just so happened to be the last thing I did at college the day before. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> Talk about uh, luck. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah, there's been a couple of moments like that in my life. Um, you know, we all get given our luck and sometimes you, you you win and sometimes you don't. Right. Now, were you studying? What were you studying in school? Was it as a computer science or what was your degree? And when you finally the degree get was, um, cybernetics and control engineering. OK, um, that's, so, that's cool. Oh, yeah. Really cool. Um, it's um. The, the, uh, I've written an article in Medium about um, my the two kind of major film influences on my life. One of them was Back to the Future, mm -hmm. um, and that was the thing that got me into skateboarding, really. Um, okay. Yeah, Marty, when his chair kind of breaks off the board and kind of skates down the high street, that was like, oh, cool, I want to do that. I want to jump over cars off a skateboard. <laughs> um, never got to that point. <laughs> Close. But then um, the other one was Terminator, and um, yeah, that blew me away. And um, I was when I was looking around for what course to do, and I found cybernetics. It's like, well, I've got to do that. Um, I was heading down computer science, or um, actually probably something more electrical engineering because of my uncle. Um, before before I found that, um, and my mum said to me, "If you do that, you're either going to create something that destroys the world or something that saves it." Um, and so far I'm kind of in between, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, how old were you when you met up with your, your spouse? 
Oh, that's a good question, um, because it's not a traditional answer. Um, okay. So, 18. 18. Um, however, uh, we we only really got together in um, 11 years ago. Um, oh, okay. So, uh, my wife is Slovakian, and um, when I was 18, she was actually the au pair to um, my aunt and uncle. Oh, wow. Um, so she was she'd come over to the UK to help them with some things and look after the, my cousins. And I think we bumped in. We, we must have met each other maybe two or three times. And then and then that was it. I was I was in a, a different relationship at the time. Um, and uh, uh, that went on for quite a while. But then when my cousin who she was, it's a, it's a long story, but uh, when my cousin who who she was looking after turned 18, she invited them to their birthday party and my i wasn't there but my brother was and he said oh you should meet my you're my brother he's just got divorced and you know it's, and that and that kind of how it came about so okay a story but it's it's one of those ones where we touched each other a long time ago and it took us a long time to kind of long serve. time to connect up then and, to, yeah. and then uh how long into your marriage before when uh, the kids started to come pretty quick um yeah, probably uh, we were um, we were dating and see, seeing each other for for a while um, before we got married, um, and kids came along pretty instantly. Really, um, mm. you know, I had um, at the time I had a, a nine year old um, as well, um, probably ten I think, um, and um, I'd always wanted more than one child, um, and uh, for one reason or another, time had kind of made it seem like that wasn't going to be possible mm -hmm. um but uh you know meeting meeting my wife and it's like oh wow actually you know it's now these things are now possible again now so it's uh no, it's uh pretty quick we both wanted kids and we had uh we had one child fairly quickly and then we had a um we went we, we tried for another and ended up with twins so oh my goodness was... <laughs> yeah three under three for a while that was fun wow okay so um Let's let's talk a little bit about the beginning of your um, um, your your career. So you know you get finished with university. What type of job did you get out outside of school? Uh, it's funny. Um, I, I I studied a lot of things within cybernetics, from virtual reality, self driving cars. I created a robot that was able to learn to move and hunt back mm -hmm. in the nineties. Um, and I went out into the into the market trying to find jobs that would do that. You know, I wanted to find a job where I could create robots, so jobs that I could use automation. And there was just nothing around. It was mm -hmm. the closest thing I found was something to do with teletext, if you remember that. Um, mm -hmm. I can't even remember how that was related. So I ended up um, falling into a software job. Okay. Um, Software was just a tool that I'd use, I'd learned to be able to do what I needed to do. So it wasn't really my choice of career. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, well, you know, it's going to pay the bills until I find you know, what I really want to do. Um, and that was with a, a credit card processing company. And actually in that job, we, we, um, we prototyped the first, it was probably in the UK and Europe, I don't know about the US, but the first tele-shopping experience. Um, so it was with a major supermarket, um, uh, major supermarket here in, in, in Europe. And um, <clears throat> what you would do is you would phone up a number and they would give you a, a cable channel to tune into. You would tune into that cable channel and you'd be connected to a worker in the store who had a camera attached to their head. And you would direct them around the store and you'd say, OK, so, yeah, that one on the top shelf, can you grab me that one? And you'd literally direct a person around to pick out the things from from your uh, for your shopping. It was it was so revolutionary back in the nineties. Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, too early. Um, so that was fascinating. But I didn't stay there too long. There's a story about donuts and fast cars that kind of made me move on. And that's so that's a lesson about how to treat your staff really, how to treat your team, motivation. <laughs> um, and then I ended up going to Vodafone. Um, and working um working there for about six years on some really interesting projects okay uh what what years were that uh, early late 90s early 200 2000s 
Yeah, so I graduated in 96. The first job was 96, 97, and then I was into Vodafone around 97. So Okay. I like to say last century. Um, <laughs> sounds fun. Um, but, um, yeah, the, the, the Vodafone thing was was great. I, um, I got to, I got given so much, um, scope to innovate. Um, and, uh, I remember going to, to one of my, uh, one of the senior chaps there and, um, we had a meeting a guy called Charlie and, uh, I was late for it because my train was late. Um, Right. And we started talking about how annoying it is. You can't see, you know, when you leave the house, you, you have no idea when your train's on time or, or late. And I said, wouldn't it be great if you could fit the trains with some kind of device that could allow them to kind of indicate where they were so you could work out time of arrival
So uh, that was amazing. Um, but the thing that frustrated me most about working there was the constant reorgs, reorganization shifts and everything like yeah. that. And in six years of being there, I think I only saw one project from start to finish. Wow. Um, and that's that's the thing that really frustrated me at the end. You know, I worked in, you know, I spent my entire career in tech and um, I'd seen that so many times. Just it's an exhilarating environment to be in because things are moving and it's fast and it's, you know, all these wonderful things. But at the same time, then if you like any kind of consistency or continuity, oh my goodness, you just get trash because it, it, you know, it's not the stability isn't always there. And yeah. uh, I, and all the companies I work for in tech, uh, only two of them are still around. And so, you know, it's just the way things are. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, you know, this, this incubator thing, we got um, spun out and I think I had the MD of Coca-Cola Europe run it. He was kind of outside the industry. So a new thinking. And we got given a timeline and said, you know, this, you've got this amount of money to play with this amount of time to play with. And then, halfway through it they said actually we've changed our mind um <laughs> here's the rug let's pull it out um but at the time we were working on things uh that were you could create a piece of content on your desktop not laptop desktop yeah and you could consume it on your mobile phone and that that was again revolutionary um we also worked with a a high-end car manufacturer to do voice controlled cars um and at the time this was just when 3g was being rolled out so the technology was so immature that they never brought it to market but these things we were i was so excited to be on them but when the rug got pulled out from under my feet it was like ah oh, it seems like such a waste such a waste of effort and time gosh voice driven cars and now we're in the world of uh the self-driving cars as far as you know the technology yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that in that technology. Uh, I think the technology adaption life cycles on that's going to be longer than people uh, are into our than technologists are thinking, because, you know, is there anybody ready just to hop in a in a car <laughs> that's not driven by a human being? And we certainly know that the computers can make w faster decisions than the human brain. Um, but it's is the is the consumer ready for to trust that and adopt it? It's I ran a uh, I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago on um, electric ta uh, flying taxis. Um, yeah, and there was a, a, a I did a poll on there, and there was in, some interesting comments about people who would who would prefer to traveling a flying taxi than they would an autonomous car. Um. And that, that was an interesting perspective. I'm trying to think why. And I think maybe it's that perception thing. Maybe it's because when you get into a car, you've got an understanding of what it should be like. Yeah. Um, and that interaction that you should have with it. But a flying taxi is a new thing. I've never been in a flying taxi. So there's none of that kind of barrier to get over. Right. But uh, the autonomous car thing, I think it's more than just consumers. I think consumers will will adopt it if they're given the right incentives and motives mm -hmm. um, and, and they're quite simple, um, really cost and convenience. I think there's a lot <laughs> more around that that isn't ready yet. Yeah. Um, legal, regulatory, insurance. Um, I can't say which role and I can't say which car manufacturer, but I, I, I was able to witness in a previous role a conversation with a bunch of car manufacturers about the trolley problem with autonomous vehicles so you know if you've got the choice of hitting you know, you're coming up to an accident and you've got a choice of hitting an oncoming vehicle or a person on a bike right who's going to make that choice and the thing that scared me most about what i witnessed in this conversation was the idea that they were discussing was being discussed as a sensible idea but it was so crazy that I thought they must be really grasping at straws. So the idea they had was when you get into a car, there's a dial. It's an ethics dial. And you choose your ethical setting of the car. 
Oh so my goodness. I'm trying to think, what icons do you have on there? Do you, at one end, do you have like a mother pushing a pram? And at the other end, do you have... <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> An ethics dial. Oh my goodness. You know, I guess probably the thing that would be next is maybe there's a woke uh, dial, you know? <laughs> <laughs> do I see, am I going to run over people at, with equity? <laughs> you know, or... So I, that that's just interesting. Makes, there's a lot of problems in that industry that still need to be worked through in quite a lot of detail. Yeah, and I think the other thing that's really difficult um, is um, there really isn't, you, I think it's hard to teach a computer intuition. You know, here where I live, I'm just outside of Boulder, Colorado, and we have lots of weather. You know, we have, we have very four different seasons, but I'm not sure you can teach um, the car how to drive in 30 inches of snow. I mean, that's just not something, you know, they can program. I mean, I, I understand programming because I've been around it for my entire career. And, but there's no intuition that says, you know what, if I take this little adjustment here, I know the car is going to respond there, but it's because of the depth of the snow and the depth of the snow, my, my reaction or my, my, um, I guess my maneuver would be different if it was three inches of snow. And so I, I'm not sure if that, I think that's going to be an interesting um, variable to try to solve. Uh, and I, it makes me wonder if in, so the short term, so these things can really get out there is if they say, okay, these vehicles can only be used in these environments. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's only in San Diego or, you know, where it's never, you know, it's sunny all the time or, Maybe, it, you know, we've, we've programmed this for rain. So London would be a great place to, you know, to operate one of these, or, you know, or fall conditions or, you know, just all kinds of things. So I, I, I think there's some um, characteristics of the variables that it's going to take some while to program that stuff. Yeah, I was thinking of something um, similar when we moved here about a year ago. Um, I've, I've, I've traveled to Slovakia quite a bit in the last 10 years um, mm -hmm. and driven here, but Driving here on a daily basis is entirely different. Um, you learn more about the roads. And, but one of the things that I, I noticed when I, that, and I couldn't understand is in the UK and the US, I've driven there quite a lot, um, a lot of the road markings, a, a lot of the road directions are on the road. So you're driving, you can look at the lanes, you can you know, see the, um, the, the lines that indicate you need to stop and you've got the, you know, all the keep clear <coughs> stuff on the road. You've got the road signs as well, but you're concentrating on the road here. They don't really rely on, on, um, on lines on the road and in many other European countries as well. It's all about the signs up on, up on, you know, sign on the signposts. And you, you made me think about this when you said 30 inches of snow, that's not uncommon here in the winter either. And I guess if you're relying on <laughs> seeing what's on the road under 30 inches of snow, you're going to get in a, yeah. into a lot of trouble. Yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah, there's that piece as well. When you think about autonomous cars and how they're checking for the uh, kind of um, the layout of the road, trying to map where the road's going. A lot of the time here, you can't see the road. Yeah. Um, you don't know where the road starts and the ditch starts. Um, so, yeah, there's that intuition and that knowing that last time I came here, there was a, a lump there. And if I hit that lump, I'm going to be in trouble. Yeah. Well, I think about my experience in driving here in this part of the, the country where you know a blizzard would be a whiteout and you know you you can't see more than a hundred feet in your vehicle you can't see any markings on the road you're staying in a lane of track from the previous driver and then you can see the occasional um you know edge of the road marker you know a little sign with a reflector on it mm -hmm. and i just when i think of that type of driving i'm thinking i don't think that you know the uh the self-driving vehicle is going to make uh going to be able to do that and then when they talk about you know we've seen you know videos and things on the self-driving trucks i'm not sure everybody's ready to saddle up for a, a 50 ton vehicle coming at them driven by a computer so i don't know we'll see it's going to be an interesting time well tell me a little bit more about your next top your next pivot point so um Oh, yeah, the next one out of out of Vodafone, um, I was asked to go and work with a company that had just been acquired by um, a San Diego company called Qualcomm. Oh, yeah, Qualcomm. Yeah, very, very well. Um, 
they had just acquired a, a company that was specializing in GPS in, in uh, mobile phone chipsets. Um, okay. And my role, it wasn't this to start with, but it quickly became this um, because that's what I was interested in, was uh, to basically create a market in Europe for GPS in smartphones. Okay. Um, so, you know, with the location-based background from Vodafone, it made a lot of sense. Um, and we were trying to, Qualcomm have a, a market maker strategy where, you know, they'll go and invest in a, in a market that they think that they can have a technical, technological advantage in. And they'll create that market until it's kind of got enough head of steam to run on its own. And then because of their technological advantage, they'll you know, gain market share. Um, so it, it was it was wonderful to be part of that kind of approach where there's no there wasn't really a quarterly target. I hate quarterly targets. I'm not yeah. a sales guy. Um, it was really that long term view. So we're looking in five years. We need to be able to get this kind of market share. What do we do now to make that happen? And I was so lucky to speak with space agencies, with app developers, with telcos, with governments, with um, all sorts of entities around the positioning sector. Um, I just absolutely loved it. That uh, was probably the best job. Um, no, actually, Vodafone and that one were, were pretty pretty amazing altogether. But in terms of impact, um, that was a really big one. Yeah, I, I had a lot of experience, uh, gosh, clear back to 1989 with Qualcomm. Um, and there, the, I, I uh, sold software solutions to the transportation industries, in the particular trucking, and with their Omni tracks and the whole, you know, the uh, satellite base tracking, those types of things. And Qualcomm was always an amazing leader in that, and and uh, still are today. So interesting enough. Um, all right. So um, any other life pivots at this time? You know, children's drama, um, career things. What what was anything else going on? I, I guess um, the the, ne the the kind of next big pivot for me was, you know, these, these had been big companies. Mm -hmm. Out of Qualcomm, I went to work with OpenWave for a while. Okay. Um, so, okay. We had an office up there in Boulder. So I've been up there. I've driven those roads. You've driven right past my place then. <laughs> Probably. Um, and uh, that, and then after, and that was kind of, you, you go from Vodafone, which is huge, to Qualcomm, which is quite big, and Open Wave was smaller and getting smaller by the minute. It was, um, it was just circling the drain when I joined them, and it was a, a real learning experience for many different reasons. But then from there, I went into startup startup land. So, I think that's probably the next big shift for me. It was moving from these big companies into startup land. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'd worked with startups a lot. Even at Qualcomm, we set up a um, a uh, kind of like an, an app development program as well. Mm -hmm. before that even was a thing. Um, but I ended up working with a company out of Marseille in the south of France. Um, and uh, I was kind of head of marketing uh, down there. And um, that was the first step away from that comfort of the big, the big organization, worrying about investors, worrying about... Oh, oh yeah, you are a startup. Um, yeah, I, I can relate. I've been through several startups and and uh, venture funded companies and and taking companies public and yeah, that's a hair on fire world. And uh, <laughs> if you're part of the senior management or any level of management in those places, it's pretty stressful because you're living. I wouldn't say day to day, but damn near. Um, you know, and, and a lot of those cases with startups because one quick move and it can just all change. Yeah, we had um, we had a number of really great opportunities. Um, we had some great experiences, some nearly great opportunities that came through. Um, mm -hmm. And then it all kind of disappeared in smoke, really. Um, like yeah. you say, pretty much overnight, everything, all the wheels came off the cart and oh, now what? Now what? Yeah. So what well, I think, especially, I, I, I know in our world today, loyalty just doesn't exist in companies, rarely. You know, the days of someone stepping onto a job and working for 35, 40 years, it doesn't really going to happen very often anymore. Uh, but in tech, it's just, it's like hyper of that. It is hyper, you know, sensitive marketplace dynamics. And, you know, if you can't pivot in tech, 
well, then you need to get out because that's just the, the expected, you know, behavior. And I think in technology, the ability to pivot is, is probably the m biggest skill a person can have because things change so quickly, you know, whether it's mergers and acquisitions, uh, capital raising short of those things, um, technology obsolescence. Um, I worked a lot of consulting projects with Dell Computer back in the day. And they, um, this is about 15 years ago, maybe a little longer than that. They could take an idea from the drawing board to the street in 27 business days. And then they would expect a life expectancy. Let's say it's a, a, a notebook computer, laptop. Um, they would say a life expectancy of no more than nine months hmm. before that that model would have to be replaced with something new or better, those types of things. And so... Hmm. Uh, yeah, that, that's a fast pace. I mean, if you think of long existing brands like a Coca-Cola or a Hershey's Chocolate or, you know, any big Nabisco, any big international brand to have that kind of change and that type of quickness of product development, it just doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, I mean, wasn't it the, um, the ex-chairman of Cisco who said that companies yeah. need to re reinvent themselves every was it three or five years? I think it was three years. Yeah, every three years. Yeah, you know, right. I'm looking back over my uh, tenure, um, and this is a proven fact. Um, the companies who are the leader in the current technology rarely make it to be the leader in the next paradigm shift of technology because they're so busy staying, you know, focused on that, you know, the revenue streams and those technologies. And so um, it's just a fact. I mean, when I started in com computing, the biggest manufacturer for mainframe computers was AT&T. It was AT&T, GE, and IBM. Mm -hmm. Well, the only one that really did anything in that whole marketplace of mainframes was IBM. And those others mm -hmm. went away. And so people don't understand that. So, you know, I was down uh, like two years ago, three years ago, when Uber was just really getting its foot here in Colorado and, you know, starting to really move and recruit a lot of drivers. And there are lots of youngsters down there. <laughs> Because I'm in my 50s and I look at them as youngsters, and they're just convinced that all, they were all that in a bag of chips, and you know they just you know kind of puffing their chests out. And I, I would just look at them, and I wouldn't say this; I wasn't going to poke them in the eye, but it's like, well, do you realize there could be one small shift here, and you're gone? I mean, this whole thing is gone, and it will, okay? Because if you read Uber's um, prospectus, you know they did 26 rounds of venture capital before they went profit. I mean, before they went public. OK, mm -hmm. and each round basically says we're just going to spend enough money. And in essence, if you boil down their their perspectives, um, it, it was we're just going to stay with this until driverless cars are here. And that's when we'll make a lot of money because then, you know, they would give up. The, they wouldn't be giving up the margin to the drivers. But if you look at their investment perspectives, that's that's what they're counting on. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I just look at these things and. You know, if you look at the landscape here today, you know, in the social media worlds, will Facebook and Twitter make it to the next uh, next generation? I don't know. I, I tell a lot of people probably not because they're focusing on things that aren't core to the business. They're folk, they've gotten so wealthy and so dominant. Now they're worried about censorship and, and, you know, social issues and stuff. Well, that's not what, that was not what they set out to be, right? And so to me, I think their leadership has their eye off the ball because they're fat, dumb, and happy. They're making more money than they could ever count or spend. And so there's going to be someone in the next level will come up with something that will surpass them. And it's just inevitable. And so I laugh at people if they get them full of themselves. It's a technology company because it's like, hang on, you got about four years, five years, you know, and th things will change. Sometimes a little longer, but, but it's not generational. No, and it's um, you know, they say it's um, we're in the second half of the chessboard. If you've heard that saying, yep, yep, in terms of exponential times. Um, if you look at how long it took, um, Amazon to surpass Walmart as the most valuable um company there. It was, I think it was twenty five years, twenty seven years, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And then how quick it took Tesla to over overtake um GM, seven years, and then how long it took. Um, Uber to overtake Tesla, yeah, three, five years, something like that. So I mean, it's, it's gathering pace, and those numbers are probably off a bit because I wrote that um, slide a couple of years ago. But um, you know, that's that's the world we're living in. It's it is exponential, um, and I try to look around for some of those signals 
Yeah, there's a great book actually by Pippa Malmgren um, called Signals. If, uh, okay. If plug there. Um, she predicted she predicted the financial crisis. She predicted Brexit. She predicted Trump. You know, so some heavyweight reading there. Wow. Um, but try and look around into what's happening happening in our societies to figure out um, uh, how that's going how that's going to change what we do in our lives um, and how our lives will look in fifteen, ten, five years time. And there's been a couple of really big shifts recently, right? Um, yeah. So obviously we've got the focus on health. Um, the kind of it's not deregulation, but understanding that regulation within the health market and the medical market needs to adapt and be more inclusive and open and you know, allow people to be, do things in places that they couldn't do before. So that's a big shift. Um, we've also seen, obviously, um, the the impact of decentralization yeah. uh, and working away from home. So probably more distribution rather than decentralization. Yeah. And I think we haven't seen, although we're now getting people returning to the office in a hybrid fashion or whatever it is, we haven't seen the end of that. Um, yeah. So my thinking here is I was working in a really large organization. We got acquired into a really large organization that um, had been made up of 76 acquisitions, I think. So pretty wow. acquisitive since the 50s. And um, they had kind of kept the brand identity of all of these different organizations together. Um, uh, intact rather and they even had all of these little offices dotted across the states across Europe across Asia um, and then they merged with another company became even bigger and the CEO said right basically if if you're not prepared to come to one of our major offices then you can go and get another job so he wanted to bring everybody into the offices mm -hmm. so all of those in you know entrepreneurial innovative people who had created these startups that got acquired were suddenly kicked out of the business to go and fend for themselves Whereas this big kind of this big organization was now becoming a bit of a monolith um, and it was centralized and everybody was working in the same office. And then COVID came along. Yeah. So all of these tiny organizations, I mean, they're like, wow, now we can compete in a way that we couldn't have competed if everybody was still in the offices. So that's going to take a business cycle, I think, to really come through until we actually start to see how that develops using technologies in particular, you know, blockchain and other decentralization types of technologies as well, because that's going to be that's going to be a big shift. And I think that's one of the things that's come out of this, which would be really positive. You don't have to be in a certain place to be able to deliver value if you've got yeah. the value to deliver. It. It's going to be interesting, too. Um... I'm not sure you can compare the world today to what it was um, back in the early 2000s. But if you if remember, we had this big rush with the internet and we had um, pets.com and groceries.com and just all of these things. I mean, people were throwing crazy money at these concepts, okay? And of course, Amazon started at that time in those things. People threw a whole, whole lot of money at it and the adoption wasn't there yet from the consumer. People weren't comfortable putting their credit card in. They weren't used to paying a subscription like a pro, an Amazon Prime or those types of things. So while the technology was available, the ad adoption wasn't, okay? Mm -hmm. However, we did see when laptops became very affordable and it was, you know, easy. Now, it's kind of funny for people like you and I who've been in tech for 25 plus years, I've been working remote for for that time, the entire time. So yeah, the, pa the pandemic was nothing. I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I, I've been uh, working at a Starbucks work, waiting for my kids forever. So, you know, or, or sitting in my car on my notebook or something like that. Yeah. So, but what happened, getting back to the point, um, we saw a lot of people try remote working at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Procter & Gamble, all kinds of companies, software companies and that stuff were pushing their people to go work at home. They closed offices and all of that stuff. However, it didn't last because people weren't ready for that yet. Yep. Okay. So the, there was a reverse trend there. They brought people, they, they closed offices and then they brought people back into the office because they still needed that team. They still needed all of those impacts and stuff and stuff. But what happened in that period of time 
is that management behavior um, was not ready, okay? And they did find that there were certain types of activities where they still needed that in-person dynamic, and so they brought a lot of people back in. Now, there were certain industries, like technology, who were more hybrid at the time and, and maintained hybrid. If you look at today's world where you can have a team anywhere in the world, like you say, my small company that I used to run before this current one, I had seven team members and only two of them in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I never met any one of them but one because he was close by. So it's a different world, but what I'm wondering, and this has been a long way to get there, is we have come to the realization for many, many industries that never had seen this or experienced this before, that you can provide value remotely. Mm. A lot of people are smart enough to know, okay, I want hybrid, you know, types of things. Mm -hmm. But the question is, where's going to be the balancing point? Mm -hmm. Are there certain industries that think that they can work remotely that maybe not as much as they would think, okay? So it's, I think there's going to be some flushing out over the next two, three years to see where it lands. Now, I could be completely wrong because things have changed so much. I mean, you go back to early 2000, there's so many things that don't exist anymore now that did back then. I can remember going to a travel agency to pick up plane tickets. And, you know, there's, there's so many examples of that that you can cite. So I'm not sure we can compare post pandemic or close to post pandemic, what, what the business environment is going to look like in technology because technology for the sake of technology is a waste. Okay. It has to be applicable. It has to be impactful. It has to do something positive. It has to make money or save money. I mean, those are the things. So I just think it's going to be interesting to see what happens over this next couple of years to see where things finally flush out because, you know, pendulum swings, you know, we, we see this all the time. Are we going to go way too far off for, off of this in on the remote? And then, you know, will it have to be brought back to this place? But I think it's going to be interesting. Well, I think on that analogy, I think COVID swung the pendulum way past the end. Oh, of the way cycle. past then, yeah. Um, and now we're on that backswing and we'll have a couple of oscillations, I think, until we, like, we find that, um, that happy point that you were talking about just there. I think in, in doing that, there will be some other things that will change as well. Um, so the idea that you can... I remember um, reading last year that Facebook was, I think it was Facebook, they were think, they were saying, okay, you can work from home or you can work from anywhere in the country. Um, we'll hire more broadly. But because you're not working in the valley, you're going to take a pay cut. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not sure that's true, but I think what we'll see there is we'll see a redistribution. If, if we get more people working remotely, we'll see a redistribution of that value across areas that we haven't seen before. And I think that's been reflected in real estate in the US as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, And climate is another thing that's gonna come in to make huge changes in, in the coming years as well. Now just well, look at what's happening in Seattle and, um, um, sorry, in Canada right now, in uh, in California with the droughts as well. It's, um, it's really, really, really serious. Well, it was interesting during the pandemic is you know into the lockdowns when everything really got pretty aggressive what was the last march april um, into may a little bit when the lockdowns were in place uh the air quality in the major cities cleaned up i mean it was interesting they were doing um, studies on that and showing the particulates per million and stuff and so quickly it just basically it cleared itself the, the planet healed itself just by people not doing their normal transportation it's yeah you're right um there was a lot of fake news around there as well um mm -hmm. so i i remember i fell for one i fell for the um the dolphins in venice did you mm -hmm. hear about that one no i didn't uh, they were saying in venice with all the canals the water was now so clean that there were dolphins coming back in and they've never been there before and there was these pictures of dolphins in the lagoon and and it was it was so i think we just wanted to believe it it was a yeah. really happy story we wanted to believe it um but it was just it was fake completely fake the water oh, wow. was clear. 
but the wildlife wasn't quite returning as people were suggesting it was. Um, and there were some things to do with the air quality as well. Now, I'm, I'm passionate about air quality. This is a, a mobile air quality sensor. Um, and I've, I've built my own. I've done my own studies and I'm trying to get some other programs here in Slovakia off the ground. Um, but uh, the interesting thing about air quality during the pandemic is that, yes, it improved in some in some places like cities, mm -hmm. but it shifted. So now we're all at home consuming energy off of different um, of different, different kinds, yep. in different places. So actually now that power station is generating more pollution than this one over here. So these things, and you know, we'll talk, maybe we'll talk about the the United Nations SDGs later on. You know, these these things. Um, mm -hmm. The thing I love about them is they re they they really replicate the complexity of these challenges that we're faced with today. Um, you can't pull on one string without tugging on some others. That's right. And I, I think that's that's the, that, that's what we saw with this. The air quality in the cities absolutely cleared up. There was nothing there to make it. Right. Um, I think some of the opportunity for technology and for society moving forward out of the pandemic is how do we capture those, how do we take those lessons and use it as a glimpse of what could be and then use technology and changes in to, to help change and support changes in society to come up with something that's better than we have right now. Yeah, it's it's interesting. There was recently a, an article published about traffic volumes here in the Denver metropolitan area. Now, Denver's had a very large population growth over the last um, 15 years or so. Um, one of the big drivers was the um, becoming a centralization for the marijuana industry because we were one of the first states that had legalized both medical and recreational marijuana. Lots of people came here, those helped. Then just growth, you know, people moving to Colorado, great place to be. But the pandemic created a, a traffic pattern shift because so many people were now working at home. Okay, so past the lockdowns phases, after people were allowed to go to work and those types of things, they're saying now that the traffic volumes in here in the Denver metropolitan area are approximately what they were 12 to 15 years ago in number of cars per day because so many people are working from home. Okay. Now there's been a, also a correlation of um, electricity consumption has gone way up. And so it's stressing the system and the other thing, but what people are noticing when you drive around Denver, don't have the traffic jams we used to have because the roads were expanded to build for current uh, or you know pre-pandemic volumes, but so many people are working from home that you can just zoom through town. So it's it's been an interesting little uh, dynamic, and now there's been a political argument of well, do we need to keep building more transportation infrastructure if more people are going to work at home, and if we're going to do transportation infrastructure, maybe it should be all mass transit and forget about, you know, at, because so many more people are working from home. So I, I just, that's an interesting little data points that pop up. The fact that, oh, well, I'm zipping through traffic. Well, it's because there isn't as much traffic as there used to be. So that's fascinating. Um, so there's two questions, a question and an observation that comes from what you just said. So um, from the, the question is, if we're not relying, if, if our cars are now, I think they said um, cars are spending 95% of the time on the driveway. Um, so now it, is it 98%, 99%? And if we're not using cars, that business model of Ubers, you know, um, mm -hmm. is that impacted? You know, how does that, that autonomous vehicle market change if we're not using cars like we used to? We don't have the challenges of congestion and pollution that was driving some of those changes. Yeah. Is that some way um i haven't thought about that really so i don't have an answer but the other observation which is kind of flip of what you said is when we came here to slovakia we came in the height of the pandemic which was a challenge um and we bought we had to buy a car here um and um we bought um a second hand um well, i think they call it a used now not second hand but a used um skoda mm -hmm. um and uh beautiful car loved the car but the thing was, it was so expensive um, and I couldn't believe that I was paying this amount of money for a used car. 
I mean, it was probably only about another four or five thousand to get a new one, not mm -hmm. the same spec, but it's like, why am I paying this much? So we started asking around and it was because um, people are not taking max at that time. We're not taking mass transit because they couldn't, um, yeah. you know, mass transit had shut down. So the families might have had one car and now they need two cars. So the demand for cars actually skyrocketed here because suddenly you need more cars because of transit shut. Oh, wow. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, because mass so, transit being shut down. Yeah. Interesting. Um, well, you know, it was probably nine, ten years ago. I've got a cousin that uh, he and his husband live in the Washington, D.C. area. And they made the decision like nine, ten years ago to not have a car anymore. Uh, one of them worked at home, the other one commuted, but it was only like an 18 block walk or something. So he'd ride his bike or uh, scooter or something like that. And then they Ubered everywhere else. And then if they wanted to go out for a holiday travel, you know, a weekend somewhere, they just rent a car. And mm -hmm. I, today I know they still don't have vehicles and they have, um, vacation properties and they will literally just rent a vehicle for a weekend. And then you have these car share platforms out there now, the Turos and those types of places. Mm -hmm. That's, that's where he has a um, relationship with a gentleman that has a car on uh, that they like that is on the Turo and they just schedule it when they need it. They know each other. There's a level of trust and stuff. And so, you know, today he's a fractional car user mm -hmm. in essence, you know, sometimes he's driving it and sometimes it's an Uber, but, but he's really, that's his, as far as his individualized transportation, he's just fractional because they did the analysis 10 years ago of, you know, maintenance, payments, um, fuel, uh, insurance, and it just didn't add up for them to have a, a car. Yeah. And so I, I think it's really interesting, you know, that like we said, both sides here, less traffic in Denver, but yet in some places more traffic because there was no mass transit. Yeah. What's, yeah. what's different think... here is not very many people use mass transit because it's too spread out. You know, you've yeah. been here. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a challenge with mass transit in cities as they're designed today. And that's another thing I think we'll see change. But one of the issues we've got here in Slovakia is a lot of the jobs are manual. Um, so you can't you can't bend steel yeah, from home. From home, yeah. <laughs> so these people who were told to stay at home, well, they couldn't really. Um, the jobs still needed to be done and they had to go to work. So they needed to get another car. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the mass transit thing, um, you know, I've spent... I say that I've spent kind of 99% of my life in the UK. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I've lived there, but I've, I've traveled all over. Um, I've only really spent you know, um, the last year living in another country. But uh, one of the things that I see around Europe is the mass transit, the way you have the different forms of the different modes of transport, whether it's the, um, you know, the buses, the trams, the, um, the trolley buses, the buses, the trains, they all kind of fit together and they work nicely. Um, better here than in the uk mm -hmm. and you know the uk is better than many places in in the us for that as well that i've visited anyway but it's still wrong um it's still designed for a society that we had um you know 50 years ago right um, it's designed for getting people into the cities yeah um and those cities and those high streets they've evolved quite a bit already and they're going to evolve even more so it's that last mile connectivity between the mass transit yep think is the thing that really needs to be solved yeah i um, think so too so um help scotching up to what you're doing today i know you're doing some stuff around sustainability because we gotta wrap this up here after a bit um tell us specifically um what you're working on now so uh i after all of this journey that we've kind of touched on here um and going back to what my mom said when <clears throat> i did cybernetics i'm either going to create do do something that destroys the world or something that saves it uh, my pendulum is swinging towards the saving it a bit. Okay. <laughs> now, all right. Um, earlier career, it was all really. I got stuck into chasing chasing the money, um, and you know, bigger promotion, bigger job, uh, more money. Sure. And then there were some of those pivot moments that we haven't touched on. It's like, well, why am I doing this? Yeah. Um, what am I doing this for? Um, and after the last acquisition, and I exited. Um, uh, the company that acquired us, I had the opportunity to just sit back and reflect, and that dovetailed with our plans to move here as well. Um, and 
I wanted to do something that was that made that kind of took me back to what I was doing in Vodafone and Qualcomm, which was doing something that had an impact, had a purpose. You know, I could actually see it. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what it was going to be. And I came up with this idea of the website, well, that's interesting, dot tech. And the idea was to really highlight interesting technology that was happening around and talk about it in a way that my mum would understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was kind of the gift that I was given to all of these different jobs between technology and marketing is talking about technology simply um, with um, some kind of context and relevance. Um, and that, that, as I was doing that, I was realizing, actually, you know, the things I'm finding really interesting, the things I'm really getting a lot of feedback from are these things that are doing good one way or another. Right. Um, and then I, I kind of decided to pivot all of my focus towards a platform that was talking about technologies, companies, leaders that are using technology to, to do good in the world. Okay. Um, and I was struggling to kind of frame it somehow. Um, and... Like many people, I wasn't aware of these things. Oh, they're behind me as well. I don't need to pick them up anymore. Um, I wasn't really aware of the SDGs um, and the Sustainable Development Goals. So suddenly I became aware of them. And I'm like, this is a really cool framework. It's yeah, it's massive. And we could talk for ages on why I like it and why I think it's powerful and why they've been kind of largely ignored um, from much of the kind of richer economies. Um but uh, so now, you know, that's what I do. I'm I'm out there to try and find these technologies, these companies, these leaders that are really doing good one way or another mm -hmm. uh, and uh, highlight them, talk about them. Now, is it through blog or are you podcasting or tell me a little bit more how you're delivering? The mo what's the modality of these? Are you getting <clears> your, <throat> your work out there? That's good. So it's it's pretty much all over the place <laughs> in a good way. Um, so it starts with the website. Uh, the website is really the the uh, the kind of tip of the iceberg. Um, there's some I've got some video interviews on there. I'm doing a whole new video series now, and I'm I think I'm breaking new ground with my with this new format I'm doing. I'm calling it an asynchronous virtual panel discussion. So I need to work on the name. <laughs> That's a mouthful, Scott. It is. You can't even abbreviate it. Yeah, you can't even. Well, the abbreviation is almost as long as a word. So, uh... yeah. So, I got to work on the on the branding, but it's it's really exciting, I think. Um, and uh, so yeah, there's video stuff, podcasts. I've been I've been playing with podcasts for for years, and I've not never really made the commitment to do it. But I think I I love them. I love the format. I listen to them all the time. In fact, yeah. the biggest chunk of memory on my phone is podcasts yeah absolutely um so i, I really feel that that's something I, I need to be doing and i it's uh yeah so you can catch me on video you can catch me on the website you've got newsletters and all of that stuff everything you can imagine okay. fantastic so what's next on the horizon so um i'm i'm quite it's, it's quite an interesting one so what has happened is I think naturally a lot of tech startups have come to me and I've featured and worked with a lot of tech startups um, mm -hmm. on those who are trying to reduce the carbon impact of um, Internet of Things through to those who are trying to stop wildfires um, yeah. and all sorts of different, different wonderful things. I too many to talk about, but I'm about to take a bite at some of the bigger companies. Okay. Um, so, I ran a poll on LinkedIn again, um, and it was basically, should companies with a questionable um, sustainable past, like mm -hmm. people who have been doing bad things, sure, should they be listened to when they talk about a sustainable future? Because uh... um, there's always a term about greenwashing, um, and there's definitely greenwashing going on, don't get me wrong, but... I think businesses of the future or businesses of the past in order to be businesses of the future are going to have to adapt. They're going to have to become more sustainable. Um, so there's no choice. They have to. It's just how they do it and what level of integrity that they put into it. Is it lip service or is it something that goes all the way down to the grassroots of the company and is embodied by everything they do? So for me, what's next is finding some of those companies, some of these big companies um, that have had those questionable paths. And I think I'll probably, I'm not going to get too far with oil companies, mining companies, tobacco companies, alcohol companies. I think right. that's going to be a split. But there's plenty of others that, you know, get a bad rep, rightly so. 
and I want to find out what they're doing and how genuine they are about changing changing their habits moving forward. So that's going to be a big one for me. Fantastic. Um, let's uh, wrap things up. I got one last question here. Um, you know, in the Western cultures, we have this thing called a bucket list. You know, the things we want to do before our time is done. Um, I'm, I'm actually interviewed the bucket list guy. His name is uh, Trav Bell down in Melbourne, Australia. Anyway, um, the bucket list things we want to do, but there's also, you are a scientist. Uh, you know that there's an opposite to everything in the world. So there's a list of things that we don't want to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Things that are, we have no interest in doing again. Now that list rhymes with bucket and starts with an F, but this is a family show. So I won't say it, but it's the effort list. So Scott, what might be an item or two that's on your effort list? And I'll give you a chance to think, cause this is kind of a left-handed question. Um, number one, uh, the, on my list would be, I'm not interested in having a collection of pet snakes, not, never going to happen. Um, the second one, me, uh, that I would throw out there is I'm not eating any more sardines. And you can add caviar to that, too. Nope, it's not interested. Or monkey brains, tried that, too. Um, and I'm never, ever going to, again, do a Lakota Sioux sweat lodge. And so uh, too much drumming, too much chanting, too much heat, too much humidity, and a slice of nudity. Not going to do that again. So what might be an item or two that would be on your effort list? <laughs> Before, when you asked me the question, first of all, I was like, okay, I've got a couple of things here. But now you're giving me those examples. I'm, I'm completely flummoxed. I mean, I've got nothing that's, <laughs> as crazy as that. Well, no, it could be something simple like, hey, I'm not, you know, I've had people say I'm not eating oysters or, you know, I, I stay away from dairy or, you know, I don't like, you know, spiders. I mean, it can be anything. I mean, you know, you've been very transparent in telling us your story. Well, this is just another insight to you as far as something in your, in your story. Okay, so um, I won't tell you the ones about uh, never working in a big corporate running a sales team because I've said that before and I've done, ended up doing it. But the one that I'm, I'm never going to do again is based on a trip I had to uh, Bogota, Colombia. Okay, okay. And, um, it was for a wedding and uh, mm. we, uh, we went out to a, a very fancy restaurant and I had this kind of like a, um, a ramen type thing, a Colombian ramen type thing. Yeah. And I was tucking into it and I was like, oh, this, this meat's a bit cool, um, <laughs> tepid meat. And I, I was so, so ill. So oh. my, what I am not going to do <coughs> is eat soup with tepid meat. <laughs> oh, okay, that's good. Well, I'm going to get you back on the show. There's lots of things unpacked. I could talk to you for hours being a, a fellow technologist and just, you know, an observer of change. And, you know, change management is usually the biggest challenge with any technology. You know, just how do we, do we deal with that? But you've been a fascinating interview. I know our listeners will love it. And so um, we'll get you back. So thanks for coming on. No, thank you. It's been okay. important. Thanks. And then uh, that'll be it for the, today's episode. We are thankful for that you tuned in. Uh, don't forget to stop by the show website, rexandrewshow.com. Uh, get full bios and information on all our speakers and lots of cool stuff. And until next time, we will say the three things that we always say. Be safe, but be bold and make it a great day.